Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight, where we stand united with the people of Ukraine for their democracy and their independence. I know the weather may not be ideal for an outdoor event, but as a reminder, it's about the same temperature in Ukraine, and many are without power, without heat, or a roof over their head. For two and a half weeks, we've all watched in horror as Putin's Russia ruthlessly attacks a neighbor who, want, who wanted peace, not war. Thousands of Ukrainian patriots and civilians, including women and children, have already lost their lives. Millions have had to leave their homes, their belongings, and their way of life to protect their families. We've watched a maternity hospital and other civilian targets attacked by the Russians and their mercenaries. And we're seeing in real time the unfortunate reality that this is a very real, very serious threat to a democracy. It has been said before, a threat to democracies anywhere is a threat to de democracy everywhere. At the same time, we've seen inspiring acts of courage, selflessness, and resolve from the people of Ukraine, from everyday citizens all the way up to the country's leaders. It's truly a David and Goliath moment. We're seeing soldiers defend their country against an army five times its size with only a tenth the number of aircraft. Civilians taking up arms for the first time in their lives to slow and hopefully fend off this unprovoked invasion. And we've watched the heartbreaking footage of parents leaving their children to fight for freedom. Hearing one dad talk about his seven-year-old daughter Diana saying it was a difficult choice better that she be without a father than without a future. Think about that for a moment and let it sink in. While Putin may have a larger army, it's clear Ukraine and its people have the courage, heart, and will to persevere. And they have the power of the truth and the moral high ground on their side. And that's why the rest of us in the free world need to have their back. <laughs> Though our state is very small, our commitment to freedom and to those who fight for it is enormous. We're here today to send a message to the people of Ukraine and to the tyrant in Russia. We stand united with Ukraine for its freedom and with its people. As I've said, I know there's little our small state can do to change the outcome of what happens over 4,000 miles away. But we have a moral obligation to do what we can Ukraine is a peaceful nation, a young democracy, working hard, now harder than any of us can know for the future of its people. These are parents and grandparents, college students and school children, who just a few weeks ago were going about their day the same way many of us would, going to work, seeing their friends at school, shopping at the grocery store, walking their dogs or riding a bike through the park. They're just like us. And now, many have been torn from their homes, taking shelter in subway stations, fearful for their lives and their future. So the fact is, Ukraine's fight to protect their people their rights and their land 
and what that means for democracies across the globe is too important for us to sit out. We must do our part. That's why I'm so pleased to be here this evening to share this message of support and to sign a bill that will contribute over $640,000, which represents $1 from every Vermonter to help the people of Ukraine. And it was important to me and all of us that this money go to an organization we know can make a difference. So we'll be donating these funds to Save the Children, a global humanitarian aid organization with boots on the ground and the expertise to do just that, save kids. And we'll hear from this organization in a few minutes. Again, I know this is a small gesture, but it's not something we've ever done before. And we hope it will inspire others to take similar steps. Because if states were to unite around the common cause, together we could make a real difference. I want to thank Lieutenant Governor Gray, Speaker Krowinski, Senator Ballant, minority and majority leaders in both chambers and all state legislators for acting on my request so quickly and passing this important bill with the urgency it deserves. I also want to thank Treasurer Pierce, Attorney General Donovan, and Secretary of State Condos for being here tonight. And I know, because I've spoken to them, Senators Leahy and Sanders and Congressman Welch all wanted to be here as well, but unfortunately couldn't attend. I want to thank them for the work they're doing to support Ukraine. Once again, Vermont has shown that in times of need, we will step up together regardless of party. Because while we may disagree on policy and politics, at our core, we share a commitment to fundamental rights. So I'm grateful to see all of you here tonight so we can stand united and send this message to the brave people of Ukraine. You're not alone in your fight. You have support across the globe and we will continue to do what we can to help. With that, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Governor Gray. Good evening. Thank you, Governor. Welcome Vermonters, legislators, members of the administration, community leaders. Welcome to Gary Shea from Save the Children. And I understand drove up from Albany today to join us. And a special thank you to Justin, Emma, Elizabeth, and Jonah from the Vermont Symphony Youth Orchestra where they went. This evening I want to begin by recognizing the leadership of Governor Scott and the Vermont Legislature, as well as individual efforts of Vermonters supporting our Ukrainian community, supporting Ukrainian students at Middlebury, Champlain, and Bennington, making donations, and holding fundraisers. I also recognize that the Appropriations Committee had to stop uh, mid-appropriations mid to make um, this allocation of reality and to do it quite quickly. Today marks 20 days since Putin's most recent unprovoked, unlawful, and unwarranted invasion of Ukraine. Over the last few weeks, I know we've all watched, as the governor said, we've watched in horror with the unfolding of events. I've been thinking about the last 20 days. We've seen civilians in subway stations, trying to walk a near marathon to get to a border, walking with children, crossing bridges, crossing rivers. 
Putin's actions not only threaten the very institutions and laws Russia and the international community came together to establish after World War II to prevent human suffering, but also international peace and security as we know it. This includes the United Nations Charter, Charter the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the Geneva Conventions, the most ratified treaty in the world which prohibits attacks on civilians and civilian objects. The preamble of the United Nations Charter, which was drafted after World War II, reads, we the people of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind, and determined to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and of nations large and small, have resolved to combine our efforts to accomplish these aims. We must do all we can now to recommit to these aims and to prevent an extension of Russia's war. No matter, no matter our differences here tonight or our political parties, tonight we stand united as Vermonters with Ukraine. We also stand united against Putin's heinous, barbaric, unrelenting attack on Ukrainian sovereignty and Ukrainian people. I know in moments like this, it's easy to feel helpless and to feel hopeless watching innocent civilians suffering several time zones away. Tonight's vigil and the signing of H717, an appropriation of over $640,000 in humanitarian aid to, the support, to support the people of Ukraine is more than just a bipartisan act of kindness. It's an act of unity as Vermonters, as Americans and as citizens of the world. And it will have an impact. Having worked for the International Committee of the Red Cross, an organization mandated to support and assist victims of armed conflict, and I have a lot of colleagues in Ukraine right now, I've witnessed firsthand the extreme impact of war on civilians, and particularly women and children. Today, the UN Refugee Agency reports that more than 2.9 million refugees are fleeing Ukraine, including unaccompanied minors, children, and families in need of emergency shelter, blankets, and food. I'm confident this aid going to save the children will help alleviate the urgent needs of women and children. I also uh, hope, as Governor Scott said, that what we're doing here in Vermont might be an example for the nation and other states on what states can do. I know Gary from Save the Children will speak. I did want to publicly acknowledge the credible work of Save the Children and other organizations working directly in Ukraine right now. We see humanitarian corridors under attack. We see humanitarian workers unsafe. We see hospitals under attack, and it's an extremely, extremely dangerous situation. Gary, I hope you'll share our support and our gratitude with your teams in and around Ukraine for their sacrifices and commitment to meeting humanitarian need. I want to close with this. Our support for Ukraine cannot end with tonight's contribution, as we all know. We must continue to prepare for the potential arrival of refugees. We must continue to ready our communities and working with our congressional delegation, advocate for refugee reform that's urgently needed. We'll need to support Ukrainians here in Vermont and continue to find ways, big and small, each day to stand with Ukraine and for the preservation of international peace and security. I'm proud to join you all tonight in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the Speaker of the House, Jill Kerwinski. Echoing the words of the governor and lieutenant governor, this is an unprecedented and tragic time for world peace and the sanctity of the sovereign nation of Ukraine. We have seen the outpouring of support for Ukrainian Americans and Ukrainians abroad and coming together to show Vermont's support for all those impacted by this tragic attack on democracy is a small but a very important way for us to show that we stand united with the Ukrainian people. Fighting for liberty and justice is something that this country was founded on, 
And while we have a tremendous amount of work to do to make Vermont and this country a more equitable place for all, we share the values of the Ukrainian people in their fight for autonomy and the right to exist as their own nation. The unprovoked attack on Ukraine is not only unwarranted, it goes against the values that we all share. The people of their nation, state, city, or town should be the ones to shape their future. Vermont is known for its principles of local democracy, and it is heartbreaking to see the work of the Ukrainian people and their effort to install a democratic government be upended by an unprovoked attack. As Vermonters, we have a long history of supporting each other in difficult times, doing what we can to support communities in and outside of our state. Whether it was organizing to collect food and medical supplies and get trucks to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, rallying for impacted towns after Hurricane Irene, or the deployment of troops to support, our, to support peace in our nation's capital. We do what we can to pick people up after they have fallen down and support those that need it most. Ukrainians need our support, and that's why I am proud of this donation on behalf of every Vermonter that will be given to save the children to help the humanitarian aid effort in this very difficult time of crisis. Tonight we stand 4,435 miles away from the capital of Ukraine, but signing Vermont's Ukrainian humanitarian aid bill and echoing the voices of Vermonters and their support of the people of Ukraine is one small way that we can bring ourselves closer and stand together with Ukraine. Looking out at all of us gathered here tonight, it gives me hope that people are coming together to rally against hate, terror, and the support of a sovereign nation, people will build a wave of solidarity that cannot be ignored. I hope this, I hope we truly use this moment of unity and the spirit of the Ukrainian people as they stand up for their independence as a reminder for us for all the work we can do to support together and support each other for a better future. We are a small state, but our voices can and will be heard. I hope this effort to support the Ukrainian people will make a difference in their fight for a free and democratic society. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. And now I'd like to welcome to the podium, Senator Ballant. I wanna thank the governor and uh, the Speaker of the House and all of my colleagues who I see out here before me and behind me. We moved this so quickly through both chambers because we all knew it was the morally right thing to do. So thank you, Governor, for your leadership and thank you to the majority leaders and the minority leaders for making sure we did this very quickly. So our hearts tonight are with Ukraine. And with all the parents and the children fleeing the bombs and running for cover, with all the families heading for safety at the border, our hearts are with the Ukrainian civilians who are taking up arms to defend themselves, who are serving alongside actual soldiers, who are standing solidly in their courage despite how outnumbered and outgunned they are. And our hearts tonight are also with the Russian moms and the Russian dads whose children are fighting a war that they knew nothing about when they were sent into Ukraine, who have been lied to by the most malevolent of tyrants. So many Vermonters stand heartbroken and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to express their feeling of sorrow as they watch what unfolds on the TV screens and their computer screens. And often, when I don't know what to do with my sorrow, I turn to the poets. Because it's the poets and the artists and the writers who are going to help put Ukraine back together when this war is over. So tonight, I share with you a poem from one of our national treasures, Mary Oliver. The poem is, When Death Comes. When death comes, 
Like the hungry bear at autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from the purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut. When death comes like the measles pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door of curiosity, wondering what's it going to be like, that cottage of darkness. And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy, and as singular. And each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does towards silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. And when it's over, I want to say, all my life I was a bride married to amazement. I was a bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. So tonight, when we leave here and return home to our families, hold your loved ones close, hold them tightly, delight in the warmth of your homes, vow to approach this world with more wonder and love and courage and do that for Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you everyone. I wanted to let you know through the efforts of Roman, Roman worked with the legislature and legislative council for a number of years. He's a friend of ours, as well as another well-known name, John Dillon from VPR, formerly of VPR, retired. But they have, they have connections to Ukraine. And Roman has a friend who works in the parliament in Ukraine. And he has us connected right now. So they're going to be playing, recording this. They're passing bills right now in Ukraine, in the parliament. President Zelensky is signing bills that they pass. So. Democracy is still working. And we want to, uh, to thank you, Roman, for allowing us to speak directly to Ukraine. Thank you. I'll now uh, sign the bill, and then we'll return to the podium for a couple more remarks. fortunate to have a representative from Save the Children here with us tonight who will share more about the organization's work to help the children and families of Ukraine. So I'll now welcome Gary Shea, the lead advisor for Save the Children, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Governor. Thanks to all of you who made this go a reality. And thanks to all the people of Vermont for being here today and supporting such a wonderful humanitarian effort. This morning, when I, yesterday, I was working on some prepared remarks to share with you. And I got up this morning and I had a, a pretty 
some good news from Ukraine. And that's not something that's happened to any of us in a long time. So I want to share with you the story I received this morning. It came from a partner organization of Save the Children. It's called Save the Children Italy. We have saved the children working in 120 countries, and we probably raise funds in 40 of those countries, many of them in Europe. So the message from Save the Children Italy was about a rescue of 21 children who are in an orphanage in Ukraine in a very vulnerable state. Save the Children has worked in Ukraine since 2014, primarily in eastern Ukraine on child protection issues. But we have good relationships with the people in the Ukrainian government, the Ukraine government, and I'm glad they're listening because they enabled something to happen very quickly. 21 children and the person who ran the orphanage desperately wanted to get these children out. She felt they were vulnerable. In addition, a few days later, we heard there was another 41 children who were accompanied but in equally bad situation. So our office in Italy heard about this. They went, they've done considerable work with migrants through the migrants who've been coming to Europe for the past few years. So we have good, good relations in Ukraine, good relations in Italy. But we had to get the kids out of Ukraine, through Poland, into Italy. In less than one week, we had all the permissions, all the official permissions. It was all done the right way with all authorities knowing about it. Poland saved the children, got buses, a pediatrician, and arranged for two translators who could translate the situation uh, of the children on the buses as they made their way through Poland to Trieste, where the border crossings were all facilitated, and their eventual destination was Florence, Italy, where they arrived safely. They were accompanied the entire way. It was all made possible because of good relationships that we've been able to establish and the relationships of all the government officials dealing with children. So the Ukrainian government is functioning. It helped get these children out of Ukraine. The Polish authorities opened up the red carpet and the same thing with the Italians. And now these children are together waiting for where they'll eventually settle. But it's likely they'll be able to sell, settle in Italy because these children were truly orphans. So that's the best news I've had of, out of Ukraine for quite some time. And there's probably no more fitting a place to share it than with all of you. Very briefly, Save the Children, as I said, has been working since 2014. We work primarily in eastern Ukraine uh, with local partners. We always work with local partners because we can reach more people. We also have been working in Romania for 25 years. And while we don't have the same number of people coming out of Romania, there are people still coming there, they're transiting, going back to, to other locations in Europe, but we're already working in migration centers and places where people are with their families. We set up play areas for the children. We help parents get the equipment, supplies they need, as would happen in any situation where people are newly arriving to a country. We are monitoring closely the situation in Odessa. If if Odessa is not safe, it's likely that more refugees would flee into Romania from Odessa. Uh, in Poland, we are also working in Poland. We have partner organizations. We're particularly concerned with the issues of unaccompanied minors. So in those two areas we're working. And in Western Ukraine, we've already identified partners and we will continue to work with what is needed. Prior to the beginning of the conflict, we had helped people uh, in, in Eastern Ukraine through our partners evacuate. How, do, how does an organization like Save the Children do that? We provide cash cards, debit cards, food, warm clothing, anything they need to get to a safer place. And that's the kind of work we'll continue to do. Okay, what are some of our concerns? Concerns are the number of unaccompanied minors, the number of internally displaced people in Ukraine which is close to two million. They're not accurate figures on where all those people are. And those will be some of the people who will be in the 
most difficult situations. The other things we're thinking about, where do we put our supplies? Where do we base them? We know what we need, but we, know we still have to get them into the country. And last but not, not least is safety and security. I want to end by thanking each and every one of you, the leadership here. I've been with Save the Children 46 years. I've never heard of any state, any county, do something as generous and humanitarian as all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. We appreciate everything Save the Children is doing in Ukraine and around the world, and we're proud to support your work. And I'd like to welcome Father Mark Corbin of St. Jacob of Alaska to offer reflections and a moment of prayer. For anyone who hasn't yet lit their candles, please do so now, Father Mark. My sisters and brothers, as you know, it's the responsibility of people of faith and all people of goodwill to come to the aid of those who are suffering. Speaking of my own faith, the Christian faith, we have clear instructions from the founder of the faith, Jesus, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and give shelter to those in need. Many other faith groups and humanitarians in general have the same imperative to help when we see people in need. When we see the daily anguish of the people of Ukraine, our hearts are gripped by pain, knowing because of our common humanity the horrendous agony of lives being upended and torn apart. In my parish, St. Jacob's in Northfield, we have several Ukrainian families. So we are hearing firsthand what people are experiencing in Ukraine. Not only are we hearing of the crushing loss of life and all the injuries, but also the constant state of fear, the destruction of homes, villages, and cities, the obliteration of all the support structures that make life livable, that make day-to-day -day life normal. We hear of the trauma of children as the bombs explode and as they experience the upending of their world many of them having to flee to an unknown land, not knowing when or if they will ever return. And if they do return, how will life ever be normal again? We see the anguish of parents who want to ease the emotional pain of their children. The images we see and the stories we hear are the harsh truth of what this war is and a reminder of what all wars are. So it is good that there's such an outpouring of sympathy and humanitarian help, not only in Vermont, but around the globe. It doesn't erase the pain, but it relieves the pain makes it a bit easier. We also have people in our church from Russia. And one of our Russian parishioners said at the start of the war, how can this possibly happen? The Russians and Ukrainian peoples have so much in common. We are brothers and sisters. How can we kill one another? And this is indeed the question of people of faith, and in this particular case, people of the Christian faith. Given that most people in Ukraine and Russia are of the Christian faith. 
who have been given the explicit commandment by Jesus to, quote, love your enemies. I spoke recently with an American friend who lives and works in Russia, who told me that many people there do not support the war. And we hear on the news of the 15,000 or so Russian people who have been arrested and are in jail, facing harsh penalties for protesting the war. And we also hear of the average citizen in Russia suffering under another form of warfare, economic sanctions, causing loss of livelihoods, hardship, and fear, many of whom don't support the war, but who are powerless to stop the war. We can say that their suffering doesn't compare with the suffering of the people in Ukraine, yet our hearts feel for all who are suffering. Many of the people in Ukraine and Russia share the Orthodox Christian faith, my own faith. And though we have to honestly admit that Christians have gone to war against each other over and over, over the many centuries of history, this was not always the case. The early Christians believed it was better to die than to kill. Later, that changed. And the war in Ukraine is the result. However, we are beginning to realize now in this age of nuclear weapons hanging over our heads and our children's heads that warfare is not God's way. We are beginning to see clearly that it is time and past time for Christians, humanists, and people of all faiths, people of goodwill, to commit to laying down their weapons, to stop tearing apart one another's lives, and to finally see everyone as brother and sister, children of the God of love. As the great prophet of our time, Martin Luther King, said so truthfully, no nation can win a war. It is no longer a choice between violence and nonviolence. It is a choice between nonviolence and non-existence. So I would ask now if we could just briefly uh, say this prayer together. O oh God, creator of the universe, giver of life and sustainer of life, we fervently pray for the relief of the suffering of the people of Ukraine, those who are there and those who've had to flee violence and go to other lands. We pray that the insanity of this war will come to a swift and just end for all involved. We give thanks for all the compassion and generosity that are being exhibited for those directly impacted by the war. We ask you to help us guard our hearts and guard the hearts of all those involved from the poison of hatred and the desire for revenge. Help us find a way to forgive those we see as enemies, realizing that they also are your children, no matter how wayward. Be especially with those who will have to rebuild their lives without some of their loved ones present, without their former homes, without all the structures that made a normal existence possible. And we ask this also for those suffering in the many places of war and enmity all around your beloved world. Help us to learn the way of peace, the way to end the violence of war. 
so that all your beloved people of this world can look out for the needs of one another and share with one another all that you have so generously given. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Father Mike, Mark. Before we conclude, I'd ask that we take a moment to reflect and pay our respects for those lost with a moment of silence. Thank you all for being here tonight. And thanks to Justin, Emma, Elizabeth, and Jonah from the Vermont Youth Orchestra, who will play one last song to conclude the event. Thank you again.